This year's theme is economic and community development, encouraging quantity and qualitative changes. Through economic development, government officials and other business professionals have the opportunity to promote civic engagement, cultivate entrepreneurship, and inspire the constant development of a dynamic, healthy state, region, and city. Each and every community in Louisiana has a role to play in attracting and retaining business investment. Louisiana's continued success with economic development hinges upon the level of preparedness of each community, large and small. This forum is sponsored by the School of Business and made possible by the endowed establishment of the family from J. Walter Porter. In recognition of his interest in improving the image of business as a career field for college students and of his concern for moral and ethical standards as expressed in his philosophy of business. Today, we have two Porter family representatives here. We have Bill Porter and we have Jimmy Porter. Let's welcome them. We are so thankful for your continued support of our forum and for the information that is provided to our students about the real world. Thank you so much for being here today. Also, I would like to introduce Dr. Austin Temple. He is the Dean of the College of Science, Technology, and Business. And I think Dr. Temple has a few words to say. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kelsey. I very seldom ever gain the applause, so I do appreciate that. Maybe when I finish, you'll also applaud. Um, it's a delight to, uh, to see everyone here today. It's a delight to have the porters here uh, to support the family and uh, to provide the financial support for this uh, outstanding event that we have. This forum relates the uh, ideas of business to what the students have been learning. And that's what makes this so, uh, makes this so valuable. It's the fact that uh, from, the, from the, the classroom to the outstanding t uh, people that we have that are teaching, to, uh, that are not teaching, that are they're talking to you today, you can see a direct correlation to what our faculty is trying to do, and uh, we certainly are appreciative of this. I'd like to thank Dr. Kel Cohen for the wonderful job that she has done uh, in organizing this. I'd also like to mention her husband, Jim Kel Cohen, who was instrumental in getting a list of outstanding teachers, to, uh, outstanding speakers today. So it's going to be a great morning. We thank you for coming. We thank the Porters for being here and their support. And we look forward to having a, a very, very productive forum. Thank you. Thank you. Our first speaker today is Donna Isaac with Coco Green. Donna is the president of Coco Green, a consulting firm dedicated to educate, advocate, and rehabilitate communities to improve the health and well-being of its residents while saving money. Donna? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much for sponsoring this. This is a wonderful opportunity. I am, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm moving. It was working a minute ago, right, Jim? You all saw that. That works just as well. <laughs> Okay, so um, my background is building construction. I'm actually a graduate of the Emmy Rinker School of Building Construction at the University of Florida, so don't hold that against me, all right? And my focus was green building, but more importantly, the combination of green building with historic preservation, which is what brings me to Natchitoches, because I started to teach LEED workshops. Anybody ever heard of LEED before? leadership in energy and environmental design. So I started to teach professionals, prepare them for the LEAD workshop, and the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training 
uh, had me come and teach a workshop for them, but they want it customized. They want it to truly reflect both the green building and the historic preservation, which has led to a whole different focus in my career, which is actually going through to sustainable community development using the combination of those tools to get an energy efficient resource, uh, a resource efficient environment. Okay. So why is this important? Well, our population is growing. And, and, and this is an interesting statistics because for the state of Louisiana, you're actually declining in population. But I say have no fear because when the curve looks like this, when we're supposed to triple our population by 2100, there will be a lot of jobs and a lot of people coming to Louisiana, right? That's in just a couple lifetimes. So, well, let me go back to this. So what is the benefit of this? What does that mean for people who are graduating from college in the School of Business? There should be work out there for you, right? Plenty work if we're doing this because we're going to have to meet the needs of a billion people within the United States. But what are the challenges to meeting those needs? Diminishing resources, right? We're going to have to learn to do a lot with very little. And anybody who can do that is going to be the most competitive business out there. So that's where this comes in. Not only are we going to have to do a lot with very little, but what do we want to do? Maintain our quality of life. It's important to maintain our quality of life. So I looked at what does it really take to create a sustainable community. And this is my little cheat sheet for uh, the purposes. I call this my cheat sheet. When I go into a project, I look at this checklist and I say, does it have cheese? How does it address the culture within the community? Are we improving the health? What about education? What about employment? <coughs> Safety and security and the environment, both built and natural. So there's a few things. This um, report is from the Ford Foundation. It was a study done by, funded by the Ford Foundation and was specific to what does it take to build wealth within rural communities? And they found that there were several different forms of capital that need to be improved. Financial, natural, social, individual, the built capital, and the intellectual capital. So I keep that in mind when we're working on projects. Okay, so this brings me to the U.S. Green Building Council. I became a LEED accredited professional in 2004. Um, I started teaching workshops about 2005 or early 2006, and I've taught throughout the country. The U.S. Green Building Council was started in 1993, and it's a nonprofit organization, although people say, really? <laughs> um, and we do have a chapter here, it's in Baton Rouge. And basically, they were focused on and are committed to a prosperous and sustainable future through cost-efficient, energy-saving green buildings. Now it's well over 18,000 member organizations. And that's an important thing because when we say member organizations, if NSU were a member of the US Green Building Council, then every full-time employee would be a de facto member of the US Green Building Council. So 18,000 member organizations actually represents a much, much larger constituency. 
So what LEED did, and this was one of the engineers, this is way back when they were just starting out, they said, how are we going to tell if a building is going to be better than a con conventional construction? And one of the engineers said, well, you know what, let's set a baseline and then let's build on it. And so that's what they did. They started out with the very top one, new construction, and it was for small office buildings and the first version really looked like that. And then they modified it. Now we have an entire suite. As you say, it's based on, it's market driven. So people thought that, you know, when we worked on new construction, when we started to work on a campus, it wasn't specific enough for a campus setting, so they modified it to meet those needs. Schools had specific requirements themselves, so we have those. So these are a list of the um, rating systems that are available out there today. I'm going to speak just briefly about them. Green building design and construction, that's major construction, right? Or the major rehabilitation of a building. So one of the buildings, let's say uh, the women's gym that just went through, well not just, uh, 2000, what, four, five, somewhere around there, went through um, rehabilitation would, if, if it were around, could have gone under lead for new construction because that's a major rehabilitation. Schools, core and shell, looks at the perspective that the developer does not get anything. If they develop the building and then they move out, then the tenant moves in, what do they get? So core and shell was created for the developer so they could advertise in advance that this was going to be a green building and get the premium on the lease rates. I did a workshop for one of the largest um, real estate management companies in South Florida and um, an export from South Florida. Uh, this was in the height of 2008 when the construction industry died, okay? And so I said to them, well, are you getting a premium on your lease rates? And they said, because their headquarters is a LEED building, LEED certified building. And they said, no, we're not getting a premium but we are leasing. So it provided the competitive advantage to keep them in business when everybody else, they're, they're, um, they, were, they were doing nothing. Commercial interiors is for the build out of interior space. And then, you know, we were doing all of this wonderful thing in construction and then we go, well, now we're using this building, how do we operate? the building and that brought in existing buildings operations and maintenance over the life of the building. Homes for residential which I thought they should never have gotten into because there is enough people in that industry but um, they're there and then neighborhood development which is one that I am just really focused on for sustainable community development in rural communities in Louisiana. Okay. People are accredited, so as a professional, as a graduate from the university, you can go and seek LEED accreditation. It gives you that additional line item um, advantage. But more importantly, what it gives you is a tool to manage your, bis your business uh, more efficiently. The LEED Green Associate is the entry level for everybody. The LEED Accredited Professional, that's specialized. And then the LEED Fellow, you have to be nominated for that. That's, you know, somebody who's really been pushing green building. And then every two years, you have to renew it. So LEED is based on a set of prerequisites that set the baseline. Things that you would do anyway in building. So if we're going to look at energy, we're going to use ASHRAE 90.1, which is the energy standard. And we're going to say, that's the baseline. Now, improve your building beyond that, and that's where you start to get points, okay? Depending on how many points you get, then you will achieve a certain level of certification. 
as I said, several different um, rating systems, but we also have different categories. And that's one of the reasons why LEED has been so readily accepted, is because it is holistic in its approach. It looks at your site, it looks at water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, indoor environmental quality, innovation in design, and regional priority. Now, I've been talking about LEED, but there is something that I call LEED on steroids, which is the living building challenge, right? Wouldn't it be nice if, you know, we really tried to mitigate the impact of the built environment? <laughs> All right, well this is the living building challenge, but basically what they're saying is design your building for the environment in which you are living in. So in Santa Fe, New Mexico, adobe is perfect because you have thick walls, it insulates the building, it makes it more energy efficient. Would I want the same type of building in Florida or for that matter here in Louisiana? No, it doesn't make sense because that would keep the heat in the building. It would keep a lot of the moisture in the building. It wouldn't work in efficiently. So we want something that's going to shed heat. We want something that is going to reduce the, and cool the building. So we tend to elevate the buildings so that air can flow under the building. We use materials that are local to us. So what material is local to Natchitoches that we see a lot here? Timber and Bousillage, right? Using the soil. So a combination of timber and bousillage, and that's why this is a amazing living laboratory to be in, because you have those structures still around you where you can see people used exactly what they had in their surroundings to build their buildings. So, so green building, nothing new, right? It's been going on for many, many years. The problem is we stepped away from it. So we look at sustainable sites, we consider limits to growth, but we start to do things that we never did before. Well, we used to do them in rural Louisiana, but we never did them in urban areas. Things like agriculture, planting our backyard so that our food is close to where we live. So the way LEED works is it gives you a list of credits and you choose the ones that you want to go after and if you meet the requirements then you get the points it's as simple as that okay so you may decide well light pollution and reduction is not something I want because I need my campus to be really safe so I'm not going to go after that point okay so then you don't get that one point you go after the others right but it looks at things like water efficiency, net zero water. Now we talk about water and we don't really think about it. We go, we have a lot of water. Well, Louisiana has a lot of water, sometimes too much, sometimes too little, right? I remember in Atlanta when they were going through some severe water crisis and they said, you know, we, you have to limit your shower to five minutes and people were going nuts. People said to the city, how come you didn't plan for this? Well, we have an opportunity to plan for this. We also have a lot of water around us. And so we need to start to capture that water, use it efficiently, and make it available in the community. So water efficiency is another one. Energy efficiency. Well, we have a lot of energy and we're finding more. But remember how many people we're planning to have? Now this is, this is if we just continue at the expected level of growth, right? This is not growing any faster and that's actually with a declining curve because we are an industrialized country. So we tend to have less children, so our population tends to grow less, uh, not as quickly. But that's where we should be in 2100. So we're going to have to think about our energy consumption and you get credit for that. The materials that you use, local materials, you get credit for that. Um, reusing a building, you get credit for that as well. 
And then, you know, most people come to lead workshops and they come there to think about, well, I need to make my building more energy efficient. Do you know where the payback on green building really is? This category, health. Health and productivity. When you create an environment that is healthy, where your employees are not always out sick, where you have daylight, which has proven to be an energizer, you're more productive in classrooms that have daylight in them, etc. even though we have to close them when we have PowerPoint presentations, then it's your productivity gains that really pay off in green building. So there are points for that. The, um, the other thing is regarding health. We talk about low emitting materials and that's part of this. Louisiana has an unbelievably high cancer rate. And you look around you and you have to pay for the health care for all of these people. Well, why? because the schools have toxic chemicals that are off-gassing in them, the homes are doing the same, etc. It's not any one thing, it's the combination over time that reduces the health of the community. So by addressing these one step at a time, then we can improve our health and well-being. And then a category for innovation and in design and regional priority. But there is also another bonus to this when we're reusing an existing building. Not only do we get the lead benefit of it, but there are tax credits available to you for the rehabilitation. And when you're putting money together to fund the purchase of or the rehabilitation of a building, then, you know, 20% tax credits can come in very, very helpful. So we think about LEED and we think about green building and we think about green rehabilitation and we go, well, is it really cost effective? Does it really save that much money? Well, the Empire State Building has gone through um, a green rehabilitation. And now, at first it was saving $2.4 million a year. Now, studies have shown they're saving $4.4 million a year. Now that's a nice line item, okay? So you really want to think about this. Yes, it does cost more. And, and the reality is, it only costs more if you don't start early and you don't plan properly. But the savings, the benefits that can be gained from doing green rehabilitation can really give you the competitive edge in your business. So my current project, the one that we're all working on here, is the Green Agora which uh, is the green rehabilitation of an existing warehouse to turn it into a business incubator, food hub with mobile market, and marketplace for locally made products. So this is one of those projects that we think, well not think, we are definitely going to help break, provide opportunity within the community, put people back to work, create jobs, nurturing businesses. And these are some of the community gardens in Natchez that I've been working on with the detention center crew and the picnic tables that they built for that garden. So giving people an opportunity to break that cycle of incarceration and give them living wage jobs when they get out through by fostering entrepreneurship and then the other main focus is to give people within the community access to fresh fruits and vegetables now you would say we live in louisiana everybody should have access to fresh fruits and vegetables right not the case we have over 50 percent of natchitoches parish that has low income limited access to fresh fruits and vegetables. What they will have is a little gas station with a little convenience store. How many times do you see fresh fruits and vegetables in there? 
very few if any and if you do see something it's like a banana for a dollar or an apple for a dollar right so we're going to change that so what are the benefits of building green third-party verification of building performance which is important because especially if you're going to be the developer that's leasing the building when the tenant comes in they will want to know is this really going to be a green building? Is it really going to operate more efficiently? If I'm going to pay you a premium on my lease rates, am I really going to get the productivity enhancements out of it? Reduced operation and maintenance cost for you to operate and uh, maintain your building more efficiently. You know, we're in here, and w uh, coming from the University of Florida, we, um, you expect a university building to be around for at least 100 years. I mean, at least. That's the minimum. So if we think about it, we have a building. How many times do you think we'll have to change these linoleum tiles? A lot, right? A lot. What if we just had polished concrete? What would we need to do? So every time we change the linoleum tiles, these have to go to the landfill. If we had polished concrete, once every 10, 20 years maybe, we'll buff it up and we're done. Very low maintenance. And that's what we have at Rinker Hall. And it's beautiful. I, I wish I'd put a picture in here. Uh, energy and water conservation. 500 students plus faculty and staff going through that building every day. We use less potable water than we do in a three bedroom house. Okay? Amazing. What we do, we collect water, harvest the rainwater, use it to flush the toilets. We have waterless urinals. Well, the university has gone to the one pint per flush urinal now. But amazing water conservation, which then gives us additional water to go back for irrigation and other uh, things around the building. We have capped six wells on campus because of our water efficiency. Uh, measures. We now have over 30 buildings there. Higher lease and occupancy rate, healthy buildings. When I started at the University of Florida, I started in Fine Arts C. And I happened to start, you know, most of us in August, and we go through the flu season. And it was horrible because it was as if everybody was, somebody was always sick. And most of us were sick most of the time. Maybe the flu was just going around. They actually tested the building after we left it and said that we were probably 90 times more skin cells in the air than we should have had. It was an old building, okay? Moved into Rinker Hall. An amazing building and all we needed was the next season we moved in in March and so the next year and we had productivity gains employee uh, the staff in office all the time students not getting sick anymore uh, just a healthy building to be in even though we oriented it the wrong way and all sorts of other things but uh, just an amazing structure and then it demonstrates your organization's values. That you care about the environment, you care about the community that you are in. Okay, so that's my little presentation. We'll open it up for question and answers and if anybody needs to leave. Okay. Sure. Ms. I, I've got a personal interest in this being a native of Mackin, but I'm interested in the many references you made to our natural resources. And as most people know, we're in the middle of a natural gas field called the Hainville Shale and then mm -hmm. the Barnett Shale, these fellows from Texas, I'll guarantee you know about the, the ship. Shale. What, what's your, but my question number one is, what's Lee's doing to promote the use of a clean fuel like natural gas over oil and coal and, and how much uh, opposition do you get to the use of that from Big oil companies, etc. <laughs> well, from big oil companies, I, I can't tell you about the opposition from big oil. But here is the thing. The first thing that we have to be aware of is energy is what stimulates our economy.
So we're going to need all of it. You know, it's not going to be either or unless we go to something like France has done with nuclear energy. So we're going to need all of it. I think it's within our, us and our community to start selecting the ones that are going to be best for our community. So we have shale and as long as we mine it in a way that is going to protect our water streams and protect our um, sports areas and things like that, then for us that would be clearly the best option. Because Louisiana, even though we have a lot of sunshine, we're not oriented in the best spot for solar energy. We don't have as much clean wind to be able to do, you know, we can do some, and there's an amazing project. If you haven't seen it, the visitor center on the way up on I-49, which has a little wind turbine on it. Um, nice green building. It's not a lead building, but it definitely is a green building. So if you pass by, stop and look at it. So um, to answer your question, I think we're going to need all of them. I think what we're going to have to do is to become very good stewards of the environment and how we use them. Now there is a lot of pushback. There is a lot of pushback. One, that solar is not efficient enough. Wind uh, is not going to, where it's located, it's too far from the grid. Uh, and, and a lot of it is coming from the petroleum industry which wants you to use oil. But the reality of it is, think about it, when, when we had, what was it, 1940s, 1950s, when we started to see oil in huge demands, in huge amounts, it was just gushing up out of the ground, right? Everywhere, all over Texas, all over Louisiana, just, just, it was just flowing. Now what do we have to do to get oil? We have to go out into the middle of the Gulf, go how many miles down into the ground to be able to find oil. At one point, we would get $40 worth of oil for each dollar spent mining it. Now, we get $10 worth of oil for each dollar spent mining it. At some point, and not too far in the future, it's going to cost us a dollar for a dollar. And then it doesn't make it worthwhile anymore. Well, so, why, why don't we see more promotion for natural gas? Um, I, I, think, I think we are seeing it and actually some municipalities like the city of Gainesville has moved to natural gas for all their vehicles. So we are seeing it in some communities but it needs, it's the adoption. It's the forward, the foresight of the communities to start to bring it in. And you know, I always tell people I have a love-hate relationship with Walmart right <laughs> they have some social <laughs> problems that I don't like but some of the things that they have been doing environmentally some of the studies that they have been doing that tell us for example if you put daylight in half they did this they put daylight in half of Walmart and then they had their fluorescent lighting in the other half and people spent more time and sh spent more money in the side with daylight so they said, well, maybe it's the merchandise. So they switched the merchandise around, right? And people still spent more money and more time in the side with daylight. So we know that daylight improves your retail sales. So some of those studies are out there and, you know, you have to love them. I had another question. Yeah, you mentioned something about the business incubator. Mm -hmm. uh, would, you, would you go into a little more detail about that? Is this a project that's being developed here in Natchitoches? Yes, this is a project that's being developed here in Natchitoches. Okay. And it, it, is it a, an existing building here? It is an existing building. It's the old Miller distributorship. It's right over there on 6th Street. Actually, probably a year ago, Tony, Jim, myself, um, several other people from the community and Dr. Webb and Marcus Jones sat down and we looked at this business incubator idea and we visited South Hall but that didn't happen and then we looked at another building 
on campus and that was going to be that was somewhere in the 6.5 million to do so this was an opportunity to be able to do it in a more affordable way and quite frankly it's preferred because we don't have the parking issues that was one of the things dr webb had said you know it's like well on game nights you won't be able to park here you know we have to take over all the parking well we won't have the parking issues because a business incubator when you are starting your business you're literally working 24 7. we're going to put a shower in there you know um and so you really need to have access when you need to have access. So it's just a few blocks from here on 6th Street, and it would help to revitalize the community. It's within two blocks of the old depot, which is a historic resource that Cane River and the city is working on right now to start to rehabilitate. So we're, I think we would be well positioned to make this a successful venture with the help of the university. Uh, what's the status of the project? Right about now, we are getting ready. It's going to be a nonprofit organization. So we're getting ready to do incorporations. The documents are at the attorney and once that's done then we'll incorporate and then we'll do we're seeking funding have you ever heard of crowdfunding indiegogo and uh, crowdfunding is something that president obama signed into law last year or the year before and what it does is it says that people from the community know what's best for their community and can invest their money wherever they want to and so you could go on there and anywhere from $15 to $250,000, you can support this project at whatever level and there are little gifts for it. So basically the idea is that we will be pretty much funded, at least the funding to purchase the building and to do basic rehabilitation before the end of this year. Could you uh, talk a little bit about how the vegetable market would work? Okay. Wonderful. Um, the food, uh, the food hub is going to do two things. One is there will be a virtual food hub where producers can get online and say, this week I have this, this, this available. And so you can actually buy from a specific farmer. You know, this person does organic milk or cheeses or this person is producing okra and you know, and you can go online and you can place your order. And then there will be a day when they bring it to us, we sort them, and then we will um, bring them out to you. We'll have a mobile marketplace. And the mobile market will allow two things. One is the distribution to a spot within each community, whether it's Campti or Natchez or, you know, so a specific spot. We're using a lot of schools. Um, as drop-off locations because you have to go there and pick up your kids anyway and then so that's one way of doing it and then the other way is if you just want to go to the mobile market and purchase directly there and we will have a location here in Natchitoches which you'll be able to go to the, the same the food hub you'll be able to go there and pick up your produce so you can order online and just go and pick it up yeah. So the producers of the vegetables will present their product to you and then you will assemble a mobile market to take it to a specific location? Right. For the distribution, for the distribution. Uh, we have been working with, I, I met this person, I'm a member of the BALI, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, went to the uh, conference this year and actually won I, with the concept of iRISE, Integrated Resources for Innovation and Sustainable Entrepreneurship. That was my business plan proposal. And there I met somebody that has been doing these farmers markets and created a great um, software application for the management. And it goes into wholesaling as well. And we are hoping, because there is an active railroad spur right there, that we may be able to help some of the small farmers to put things together in quantities that we can export. So, um, ambitious little project. <laughs>
but first we're taking care of our local needs then we can go elsewhere with it but there's some exciting things going on here with your the global um, entrepreneurship initiative and things like that that would make this the perfect place for a business incubator speaking of that when you mentioned that there were 18,000 uh, lead members how many of those are in Europe and how much in the United States this, this is um, primarily a European organization no 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 this is primarily a United States organization it's not in Europe. no 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 not the US Green the Building, Green Council. Building Council is the US but is B is B no lead is US um, however, and, and that's one of the things, ISBE is the International, I think, Institute of Sustainable Built Environment, and that is the, nas the international um, sustainable building organization. Uh, LEED is born and raised in the United States. However, LEED has been exported. Countries like Germany, um, Japan, India, you know, all over the world, Italy, are picking up lead and adopting it because it's a checklist. It's really easy to modify. You look at what are your local building codes and make those the reference standards and then modify based on the increment. So we're seeing lead exported and now it's becoming sort of the national, the international de facto green building rating system. Before that there was BRIAM and CASB and there are many others that Europe had before lead but but we're really taking over the market and the Canadian Green Building Council uses a version of lead and actually lead started in sort of Portland in the Cascadia so it was a combination of Portland and um, Canada working together to come up with the green building guidelines and that's where the living building challenge came out of as well any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.